Welcome to the History Lord. You join us here and uh, I'm in Covent Garden today, uh, junction of Southampton Street and Maiden Lane. And it's Maiden Lane that we're going to be talking about today. But first of all, I want to thank you all. This is our 200th video um, on YouTube. Um, we're also on TikTok as well, but thank you very much for all of your support. We do appreciate it. And there's only one last thing to say, James, roll titles. Welcome to London. So as I mentioned earlier, you join us here in Maiden Lane. And we're going to start off, we're actually going to walk through today the whole street, because there's about four or five or five or six different things I want to show you down here. First of all, we're going to start with uh, what's in a name. We like doing uh, random ones like this. So Maiden Lane, um, there's two theories of why it's called Maiden Lane. One is because at this end of the road here, just behind where the, the cart is, there used to be a giant statue of the Lady Madonna. And uh, they think that's where the name came from. But that was moved around about uh, 1857 because Queen Victoria didn't like getting stuck down here in her carriage when she went to the Vaudeville and Adelphi theatres. So uh, they got rid of it then. So that's fine. The second explanation is a little bit more uh, disgusting. Uh, this used to be an ancient pathway called Midden Lane. Now, Midden is an old English word for, um, want of a better word, a dung heap. Uh, yes, this is where they used to put all of the uh, effluent from the beasts of burden, and uh, because this used to be um, part of the gardens for the convent. It was owned by the Benedictine monks in uh, Westminster Abbey, and this was originally called Convent Garden. It, over the years, it became corrupted into Covent Garden. Now, at this end, at the eastern end, we've got this uh, Catholic church here. This is Corpus Christi. This was uh, uh, finished in 1874. I think the foundation stone was laid a year before that. And I think the architect was uh, Frederick Pownall. I think that was his name. And uh, he did have a problem because of the unusual awkwardness of the site. And uh, a few of the other buildings around here didn't like being um, outflanked by a church. So he actually dug down about three or four feet and buried the church in there as well. So there we are. Corpus Christi, it's well worth a visit, it's very ornate inside as you would expect. Now, just behind James up there, we're going to walk down uh, because um, just happens to be a very famous restaurant down here that happens to be the oldest in England. So this is Rules, this is uh, the oldest restaurant in London, I think it's the oldest restaurant in the country as well. It was established in 1798 by Thomas Rule and uh, it specialised at the time in oysters and then it became uh, a very specialist in uh, British food, especially game. And I do believe they've got their own uh, estate up in uh, Teesdale, um, up in Scotland, that uh, produce all their game for them. Now, Thomas Rule, there's a bit of a dark side to Thomas Rule. He was convicted of murder. He murdered his wife, Isabella, and his daughter, Elsie, but he was found to be insane and he was sent to a criminal lunatic asylum. So it remained in the Rule family right up until 1914 when the owner at the time, Charles Rule, wanted to move from London to Paris. So he did a deal with a chap called Thomas Bell, um, who also who had a restaurant in Paris. They did more or less a straight swap, which is rather good. The war came along in 1914. Thomas Bell went to war as an officer, so he left the head waiter, uh, another chap called Charles, and he left Charles in charge. That'd be a good title for a show, wouldn't it? Charles in Charge. I don't know why nobody's thought of that before, but there you go. Anyway, I'm digressing. It remained uh, in the Bell family right up until, I think, it was early 80s, 1983, 84, when it was sold to a chap called John Mayhew. And I think might still own it, or his family at least still own it now. Some of the famous people who've uh, dined in here uh, in the Victorian times include uh, Charles Dickens, uh, Thackeray, um, and in uh, certain times as well, Right up there, the most intimate table in London used to be Edward VII and his mistress, Lily Langtree, but shh, don't tell anyone, just between us two. Uh, 20th century, some of the notables who've uh, dined in here, at the um, sort of like people like, um, oh, Laurence Olivier, Alec Guinness, etc, etc. If you're lucky enough to go inside, it's decorated with lots of contemporary prints from the Victorian era all the way through up to the modern times, including prints that, uh, and playbills that um, Charles Dickens presented um, to be put into his private dining room up there. If you think you recognise rules from films, you probably do. It's appeared in a couple of Bond films. I think the latest one was Spectre. And uh, if you're a fan of Downton Abbey, it's appeared in several episodes of Downton Abbey. Now, we're going to go back on ourselves just a little bit, just over there, because we've got two things to look at. One is the Vaudeville Theatre. 
and two is what used to be there on a green plaque. See you over there. So those of you who've watched the channel for a while may remember we did a uh, video all about Richmond Theatre and we started at the back of the theatre going through the stage door. We're doing the same here. This is the stage door to the Vaudeville Theatre. Now the Vaudeville Theatre was designed by a chap called CJ Phipps and uh, in 1870 it was uh, opened and I think the chap's name was, uh, the, the owner was a chap called Richardson who had a failed billiard hall and he realised that uh, theatres would make more money. So he had that built instead. The Vaudeville Theatre was a little bit strange because it was built behind Strand. The front of it is now in Strand, but when it was built in 1870, it was behind uh, two houses down there, 403 and 404. Um, it was in about 1882 that uh, the owners acquired the front two houses, and uh, by about 1889, they were demolished, and it was CJ Phipps again who um, built the front of the theatre as we know it now. These days, Back then it was 1,100 seats, I think it was four tiers. These days I think it's 694 seats and um, it's over three floors. So stalls, dress circle, an upper circle and a few boxes as well. Now, it's also a rehearsal studio in here and if you hear singing behind me, that's because um, they're auditioning at the moment. But this used to be the site of something called the White Wig Inn. And why was the White Wig Inn important? It's because of a little plaque up here Voltaire was uh, exiled from Paris in uh, 1726 and this was one of the places he actually lived in uh, London. So Voltaire, who was Voltaire? He was born Francois-Marie Ararat and his uh, pen name was Voltaire. He was one of the most famous French writers in history. I think it was 1718, one of his first plays and that was Oedipus, the tragedy Oedipus as well. In 1715 he was uh, exiled from Paris where he was born and uh, he travelled a few miles down the road and then went back to Paris in 1717 where he was placed into the Bastille. Uh, Bastille? Bastille? Is that how you say it? Bastille, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, we are. You're looking at me. I don't speak French, so there we are. Forgive me. You're nodding. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nate. Well, he's placed into the Bastille. In 1726, he was again placed into the Bastille, but only for two weeks, and then he was exiled to London. And this is one of the places where he stayed. Two months before his death, Voltaire was back in uh, Paris and uh, he said his farewell performance, or he did his farewell performance before a crowd, uh, a production of a play called Irene. And he actually said to the crowd, I die adoring God, loving my friends, not hating my enemies and detesting superstition. He died in his sleep on May the 30th in 1778 in his beloved Paris. Now, next little stop down there and uh, we go from theatre to recording, so this way. Now, believe it or not, in the recording industry, this is actually a very important street because it was here in 1898, the first recording studios in Europe were actually sighted. They were actually sighted by a chap, it's on the green plaque up there, that I no doubt James would insert so I can talk about it. It was actually uh, sighted here by a chap called Fred Gaysberg who was an apprentice to, now these names are escaping me because it's all music and as you know mere music don't really get on so it was. He was actually uh, an apprentice to a chap called Emil Berliner. Now Emil Berliner was the man who invented a, uh, the disc recorder and he also re uh, invented uh, a recorder to play the discs on. Um, that was improved by a chap called Eldred Johnson was the man who improved it by adding another uh, more powerful motor to keep it running and along with Alfred Clark it was Johnson and Clark who um, invented something called a reproducer. No I've no idea either but there you go that's how it was done. But Fred Gaysberg was uh, an apprentice of um, Berliner so he came here opened up the first studio in Europe and uh, by their standards, it was extremely sophisticated. By our standards, it was very, very primitive. So to get the recordings, you would shout into a cone. So you'd shout into the large end and the cone would put the music into, or your voice into the recorder. You'd be accompanied by a piano and it was as simple as that. What did they record? Well, they recorded the music hall stars in London of the day and it was very successful. Now the gramophone company didn't stay here very long and he stayed here about three or four years and then they moved elsewhere in London but uh, and they very successful and I think it was uh, in the 1930s they changed their name from the gramophone company to um, oh, what was it 
EMI. And they're still going now, I believe. And in 1931, they opened their most famous studio, which is just a few miles northwest of here, near St John's Wood, and that just happens to be Abbey Road. Now, what's next? Let's have a think. How about some murder and mystery just over there? So next thing we're going to look at, we're now again another stage door. We're at the back of the uh, Adelphi Theatre. Um, now the Adelphi Theatre is actually the fourth theatre on this site. Uh, the first one was opened in 1806 and this one dates back to 1930. And I believe the architect was a chap called Schaffelberg. What a great name. And uh, he was the, it was the all the art deco style. The Vaudeville, along with the Adelphi, the Garrick Theatre, the Duchess Theatre and the Lyceum, back in the 1960s, along with Rawls and all of these houses along here, were threatened with demolition because uh, the Greater London Council, as they were back then, decided they wanted to redevelop the whole area. Thankfully, uh, a campaign was started and uh, uh, it was stopped and that's why we've got all these preserved buildings around here today. One of the main instigators of that campaign was the poet John Betjeman and uh, he campaigned along with the Actors' Union Equity, the Musicians' Union, and lots of other interested parties, and they saved the area. By the way, John Betjeman was also um, instrumental in saving the uh, Midland Hotel at St Pancras Station, that wonderful uh, Victorian Gothic um, architecture that we have, which is now uh, part of the Eurostar terminal. Anyway, I'm digressing. We're here because I think James may have in the background, there's a green plaque up here. So this green plaque here, tells of a terrible murder and that was the murder of William Terrace. Now William Terrace was the stage name of William Lewin and he was born in uh, to an Oxford uh, lawyer I believe and uh, after a short stint at Oxford and uh, in the Merchant Navy he fell onto the stage, not literally fell onto the stage but he became a stage actor. He was well renowned for his swashbuckling roles and his uh, matinee idol roles such as uh, Robin Hood and he was also a very fine Shakespearean actor. By the age of 50, he was at the height of his fame and he was working here. And I think the play he was working on was called Secret Service. So it was on the 16th of December that uh, waiting in the stage door here was a chap called Richard Prince, who was another actor, but not as famous as Terrace. Now, Richard Prince also had a problem that he was an alcoholic and uh, he had uh, mental health issues as well. Now, William Terrace helped him out as much as he could, gave him small parts in a few uh, plays that he'd done and over the years. Sadly, in one of those plays, Terrace had to, uh, had to sack um, Prince because he made a few remarks that were off the cuff and uh, a little bit below the belt, shall we say. But Terrace looked after him. He actually carried on sending money, small bits of money to him via the Actors' Benevolent Fund. Uh, now this particular, about three or four days before the actual murder itself, uh, just at the Vaudeville Theatre, Prince was actually thrown out of the theatre. There we are, for whom the bell tolls. The Prince was thrown out of the theatre for causing a disruption. A day later on the 14th of December, he was seen in the dressing room of Terrace up there having a very heated argument. And on the 16th, as I said, he waited in the, in the stage door where he stabbed him several times. He was arrested and the trial was a sensation, not just in London, but all across the country, selling newspapers galore. Prince was obviously found guilty, and he was uh, found to be insane, and he was actually sentenced to life imprisonment at uh, Broadmoor um, Prison, which is there for the criminally insane. He died there in 1937, some 40 years later. Now, at the time, there was an outcry because of his uh, light sentence, shall we say, the actor manager, Sir Henry Irving, uh, actually said, and I've got the quote here, he, the actor manager, Henry Irving, said, uh, Terrace was an actor. The murderer will not be executed. So there we are. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with the death penalty, but that's my opinion. You may think something different. Now, we've got one last thing to see, and that's just next door, and that's the birthplace of somebody else you may just have heard of. So our last stop today down Maiden Lane is here, which is now a pub, restaurant type thing, does the usual fodder, burgers, fish and chips, etc, etc. Other eating establishments are available, I must admit, but there are. But there's a green plaque just up there, and it's to a very famous painter, J. M. W. Turner, Joseph Mallord William Turner. Now, he was born here above his father's bar uh, barber shop at number 21, 
and I think it was 1727, don't quote me on that, you might have a look up there. I can't see from here what it was, but I think it was 1727. Uh, he knew very early on he wanted to be an artist, and uh, he joined the Royal Academy of Art at the age of just 14. Now, he was described by some as the first modern painter. He used uh, light and uh, techniques that were brand new at the time. Most people didn't paint inside, they used studios. He actually painted outside in all elements and all weathers. He painted sunrises, sunsets, he used light. He was the user of light and he liked to paint in the open air. He carried his paints and his sketchbooks with him wherever he went and during his lifetime he painted or sketched over 30,000 works. It's not bad, is it? Now he passed away in uh, Cheney Walk in Chelsea and uh, he's actually buried in uh, St Paul's Cathedral, in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral next door to the other famous artist Joshua Reynolds. Now you may see Turner's art every day if you handle money because on the new polymer £20 note, um, on the back of it, on the reverse, there is his self-portrait from around about 1799 and there was also one of his famous um, landscape and uh, ship paintings, the Fighting Temeraire that was docked at uh, Dulwich, uh, not Dulwich, at um, Deptford at the time when it was being dismantled. This was our 200th video, so thank you very much for watching. Thank you indeed for your support. We do appreciate it. Um, and if you want to see what we do outside these, you probably know the drill by now, then go to historylord.co.uk, see about a walking tour of London, or have a look for James's YouTube, TikTok, and uh, website channel, and that's Last Line Films. Thanks for watching. It is rather cold here, so I think we're going to warm up with a cuppa and then carry on filming for a few more videos. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Take care.